Well, good morning. Thank you guys for worshiping with us. I hope you guys are excited to be here. If you guys are able, would you stand to your feet to worship the King? I want to apologize in, in advance. I had told everyone, this is what I'm going to read. And I'm going to read something completely different because I just felt God laid on my heart. And uh, so we're going to read that this morning. But it's from Ezekiel 37. It says, the hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. And it was full of bones. And he led me around among them and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. Behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, oh Lord God, you know. And then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, oh bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sin, I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. And this morning, I want that to be on our hearts that maybe there's an area of your life where you feel that the bones are dry and there's no life. And this morning, I want you to know that God is saying and leading us into saying, just speak to the bones and they shall live. So this morning, Jesus, I don't know exactly why you placed that verse on my heart, but I'm trusting you. We're trusting you with everything in this service this morning. You are a mighty and a precious God. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are faithful. And we worship you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Shackles I wear Oh, I bought on my own Come on, we sing Scarlet sins had a crimson cost You nailed my dead to that old rugged cross An empty slate at the empty grave, thank God that stone was rolled away. And Lord, I confess that I've been a prodigal and made for your house, but I walk my own road. Then Jesus came
Come on, let's sing this out together. I see bright crimson robes. I see bright crimson robes draped over the ashes. A wide open tomb where there should be a casket. Children are singing and dancing and laughing. The Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. Roses in bloom, they pushed up from the embers. Rivers of tears flow from good times remembered. Families are singing and dancing and laughing. The Father is welcoming. This is our home. Oh, heaven joins in with a glorious sound. And a great crowd awaits. promise of heaven. So let's sing that together. See bright crimson robes draped over the ashes. A wide open tomb where there should be a casket. And children are singing and dancing. Come on, lift your voices this morning. Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. Roses in bloom. Pushed off from the earth. Rivers of tears hold from good times remember. Children are singing and dancing. Come on, let's say the Father is welcoming. Jesus, we thank you. We worship you and we praise you. You are an awesome God. Jesus, let us never go tired of worshiping you. 
and singing your praises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, guys. I'm going to switch over to the announcements so the light should make it look like announcements in a sec. Hey, there it is. Good to see your guys' faces. Thank you guys for, for being here this morning. Uh, it might look a little different. Elijah's doing announcements. Elijah has something he's excited to talk about, and he's going to stop talking about it in the third person now. Um, but if this is your first time here, I promise, don't let me be a reflection of the Lakes Church. Um, there's somebody who speaks well better than I do uh, coming in just a moment. Um, but we're excited that you're here, and uh, we would love to get connected with you, um, not, to, not to be weird or creepy or try and get your money, but because we want to have community with you. And that's our heart for this church, um, is to grow together in being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and joining Jesus' renewal. Um, and that's our heart, and that's our vision. So if you're interested uh, in being a part of the Lakes Church and being a part of our community, um, there's a table out there. And on the seat that you sat in or next to you uh, is a little bulletin, and it, there's a connect card that you can just rip away. Um, and we would love it if you take that and, and one of our um, lovely greeter team would love to connect with you. Um, and you can also, if there's something that you um, need prayer for, if there's something going on in your life, uh, we would love to, to hear about that. You don't even have to put a name. If you just want to put a request, and we would love to pray with you and join with you in prayer in that time. Um, but yeah, that's, that's that portion. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is we have this fun thing. Uh, if you don't know, a lot of us guys get together on Thursday nights, and if you're interested in doing that, please come. Uh, and we have wings on Thursday nights at 8 o'clock p.m. after all our kids go to bed. Uh, and it's been a lot of fun. We've had, like, great times at community. Sometimes there's three of us. Sometimes, like, a couple weeks ago, there was 20 of us, and the waitress got very angry. Um, but we, we get to just have wings together, and there's no, like, agenda. We literally just talk. Sometimes we talk about Star Wars. Sometimes we talk about sports. Um, but it's a fun time for our, a lot of us guys to get to, to commune and get to, like, have that dinner together. So if you're interested in doing that, please uh, email me, and I'd love to love to add you to the group text at Elijah at church. But coming from that, um, my son, who is five years old, said, Dad, what if we did a dad's and kids beat-ups night? And I said, tell me more. And he said, what if we had pizza and wings and games, and we had the dads bring their kids, and we do a game night? And I said, you just planned an event, and that's really cool. And so coming from that conversation uh, and further conversations, we're going to be doing a dads and kids uh, night. I don't have a cute name for it because I, I, I'm a guy, and I just was like, oh, dads and kids game night. That's cool. Uh, so this Thursday, here at the school, we are going to be having a dads and kids game night where we're going to have pizza and wings, and we're going to get a hangout, and uh, we're going to have Nintendo Switches and board games. And I don't care if your kid is like three months old or like 31 years old, please come out. And you don't even have to have kids. Just come and play games with us. And we'd love to get to connect with you and get to have a lot of fun. Uh, but that's this Thursday at six o'clock. Uh, and we're just going to go until we go. Um, depending on how intense Smash Bros get, we might go until like well into the morning. Uh, and that's fine. So we're going to do that um, this Thursday at six o'clock here in the building. And that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and that's all the announcements I have this morning. I do also want to put a little push here, uh, ushers, you guys are welcome to come forward. If you're interested in like taking the next step into uh, community with the Lakes Church, um, please feel free to volunteer. We would love, uh, Allie would love more kids ministry workers. We would love to have you on the worship team or the tech team uh, or greeters or donuts and coffee. There's so many opportunities um, to get to serve here at the Lakes. Uh, and that also leads me to my next thing that I almost forgot, baptism classes. They, we are going to have baptism classes April 21st, so not this weekend, but next. Um, so if you're interested in being baptized, um, please come forward. Uh, greeters, or ushers, if you'd hold on just a second, I'm going to read the giving liturgy before we pass the plate. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I don't do this often. Um, this is why. But before you pass the plate, we're going we're gonna to read the giving liturgy together. Um, but yeah, a, a baptism classes, if you're sitting doing, joining that, uh, we do have uh, that available on the website. So if you would now, Join with me as we uh, say the giving liturgy out loud. It's going to be on the screen. All right, if you guys would, would say this with me. Holy Father, there is nothing I have that you have not given me. All I have and am belong to you, bought with the blood of Jesus, to spend everything on myself 
And to give without sacrifice is the way of the world, and that you cannot abide. But generosity is the way of those who call Christ their Lord, who love him with free hearts and serve him with renewed vines, who withstand the losing of riches that chokes the world, whose hearts are in your kingdom and do not and not in the systems of the world. The next slide. I am determined to increase in generosity until it can be said that there is no needy person among us. I am determined to be trustworthy with such a little thing as money that you may trust me with true riches. And above all, I am determined to be generous because you, Father, are generous. It is the delight of your daughters and sons to share your traits and to show what you are like to all the world. I sure you guys are good to go. And I'm just going to pray over us, and then Kyle's going to come up and preach a message, and we're going to continue practicing the way of Jesus. Father, we come before you. We come before you. Some of us may be tired. Some of us may be exhausted. Some of us maybe feel lifeless, Jesus. But Jesus, I pray that we would come before you, not with our Cain offerings, but with our Abel offerings, with the first fruits, with everything that we have. Jesus, that we may become more like you. And Jesus, we love you and we praise you and we thank you. It's your holy, mighty, and precious name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, look who's back. Come on. All right, I won't, I won't call you out, but I see you. I see you. Yes. Yeah, something, something like uh, spring in West Michigan, all of a sudden there's people walking on the streets who I haven't seen for three months. Like, I'm like, oh yeah, we, do it. we have neighbors. This is lovely. Meanwhile, our boys have been out going wild. Um, our teaching text today comes from the Gospel according to John. You can flip your way on over there. Just, uh, just lift up your Bibles if you got them in the room. Okay, yeah, get them high up in there. Get them high up in the sky. Okay, um, let's go. Come on now. Um, if you're here and you're like, why are they holding up their Bibles? Um, we actually have this conviction that this is God's Word. If we read it and respond to it, it will actually change us. Not because of black letters on white pages, but because the living word comes through his personal presence and mediates the reality of heaven to us through the scriptures. And we just want to come and submit ourselves under the authority of Jesus. And you're like, oh, I I would love to hear from Jesus. Let me invite you. Open up the scriptures. Like, but I want to hear what he sounds like. Read it out loud. And it's just that simple, my friends. Uh, So I invite you to John chapter 15. That'll be our teaching text today. We're um, We're not going to go through line by line, but we will be lingering around um, verse 5, but we will read this whole passage. John 15, 1 through 8. I'm I'm reading out of the NIV, um, but it'll also be up on the screens here, I believe. So um, let me pray and we'll, we'll read. Holy Father, we thank you that you have come to us, that you did not see fit to linger in the backdrop, that you are not a distant and remote God, but that you are present. And since Genesis 2, you have been moving forward. And what we see started in a garden will end indeed in a garden, that a new heavens and new earth is coming down out of heaven. And you are making all things new. And we began to see the newness of your glory in the face of Jesus. 
And right now you are moving toward us. You interrupted human history with your love. And we ask that you would interrupt our hearts. You would interrupt our history. And you would begin to shape and mold and be building a church in this place. So we come to your word and we ask that you would speak to us according to your kindness. John chapter 15, verse 1. This is Jesus of Nazareth. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are, a, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. See, today we, we continue in this little series called Practicing the Way of Jesus, but that's just shorthand for Practicing the Way of Jesus Together for Michigan's Lakeshore. And if you have been around for a while, um, then you might say, oh, those words sound fresh. And if you're brand new, you may also be saying, oh, those words sound unfamiliar to me. Well, for all of us involved, these words, they are, they're new-ish here, but they are not novel. Uh, this past, goodness, winter, we stepped in to this gap, this gap between how do we actually begin to see the culture of heaven touch down on the lakeshore, and then how do we hold a posture of unity in the essentials, liberty in the non-essentials, and love in all things? What does it mean for us to be a church that can hold the tension between those two? And what came to the fore was this practicing the way of Jesus together for Michigan's Lakeshore, a way for us to actually pull down on the culture of heaven and see it realized through our hearts. What we realize is that that's not going to happen by accident. It will take a great measure of intentionality for us to become those types of people. And so we simply want to take up this both ancient and historic reality and bring it to the fore for our community today practicing the way of Jesus. I'm going to say this until you are so tired of hearing it, but you know it. We're going to practice the way of Jesus together for Michigan's Lakeshore. In other words, you are not the end goal of life at this church. Oh, bless God. We live in such a self-centered time. I mean, you woke up in this morning and you thought, does my, fit, does my outfit look nice? And that's great. Like, put, like compose yourself. Don't be like a toddler, like my kid, who's like running around without the pants. I digress. Compose yourself, and yet know like the composition of your life. Like in this community, you are not the end goal. You are a part so that we might all display the beauty of Jesus. And so there's two parts here. You are not the most important thing, but you are desperately needed here. And so we all need to collectively move toward this. Uh, to, I hope that doesn't sound burdensome. And just to bring this to the fore, uh, a person, to quote somebody from our church back to the church, he said this to me this last week. He said, I, I love that we are practicing the way of Jesus and not perfecting it. I said, oh, yeah. And that is a great distinction. That's an important distinction because practice invites us to try on and explore life with Jesus. It's, it's less like science class where you need a formula to then get a direct output and more like, I don't know, um, judo where you are having to try those moves on and get it into your muscle memory and, and begin to, and I like that image of judo because you're having to wrestle these things. You're having to get in and grapple with the scriptures and, and deal with one another. If you look to your left and the right, there are people in the room, some whom you love, some who you have yet to love and others that you dislike. And that's why you're sitting on opposite sides of the room, probably. But I'm just, like, the, the point of this, thank you for the awkward laughter of the four of you. The point is that we get to do this together. And, and we actually need one another to put this into practice. 
And I, I don't know what that evokes in your mind, this idea of practicing the way. Uh, some of you, you're thinking of, you're into sports, so you're thinking of Allen Iverson. Practice. I'm talking about practice. And others of you, you're thinking like, oh, I, I actually, I practice law. I put the profession of law into practice here. In the language of Jesus, it employs, it employs more creative language. This idea of poeo, which is the Greek word behind our English word practice, it, it draws on God's creative work. And so for Christians to practice is really for us to participate with Jesus in God's creative work. The, the, the living God, I don't know if you knew this, but news flash this morning. The living God has a desire to release renewal in all of the earth and wants you to join him. Yes. This is, this is, this is the thing. Practicing the way is simply our response. Like, we get to do this. In our practice, it's not about personal advancement in God's kingdom. That's more American and Western than biblical. Instead, Eugene Peterson puts it like this. He says, following Jesus doesn't get us where we want to go. It gets us where Jesus goes. Just hear that again, because Eugene just hits this so well. Following Jesus doesn't get us where we want to go. It gets us where Jesus goes. And some of you, you might relate to this, some of you maybe a little bit less. And so for all of you, let me just tell you how I feel about this. When I'm stressed, when I'm strained, when I'm fearful, I try to control my environment. Now, I imagine I'm like one of the only people in the room who tries to control his environment in the face of stress. But Jesus doesn't work like this. Jesus is not an environment to be controlled. He's not a force to be ushered in. Jesus is a person to love and be loved by in return. To practice the way of Jesus is to practice giving and receiving love in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And for some of you, that feels too squishy, so you have to practice it until it becomes the resolve and grounding of your life, the practice of giving and receiving love by the power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. As my wife uh, continues to remind me, we only try to control the things we don't trust. Ooh, let that one land in your heart. You only try to control the things you don't trust. Often that's given to me in the domain of parenting, but practice, in, in, in terms of following Jesus, it cuts against the grain of control because practice invites us to keep in step with Jesus. It actually it invites us to submit to Jesus and then to receive his way as the better way. In, in other words, you could talk about relaxing into Jesus' presence when you think about practice. By the way, this is all review from last week. So if that's practice... The integrating God's creative work, like manifest in Jesus, into our life with Jesus. If that's practice, and that cuts against the grain of control, what is the way? Because we're here to practice the way of Jesus, and I hinted at it a moment ago, but the way is the way of love. And I'm not talking about the cultural definition of love, which is love is love, which means nothing. That, 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 is, that has no substance to it. But love actually revealed in sacrifice. Love is to give oneself for the good of others, even at a cost. It's willful sacrifice for the good of others. This is the way of love, and we see it embodied in Jesus. Jesus will say things wild. He'll say wild things. I lay down my life. No one takes it from me. I willfully give it. And I have the power to take it up again. This is love embodied in the person of Jesus. And that is the way. That is the invitation of life with Jesus, is to give ourselves away in love. And what's so beautiful, at least insofar as I have encountered it, is I don't have to muster up love. It was prayed this morning in our pre-gathering pre prayer, like, we love because we have first been loved. So how do we know what love in the domain of life with Jesus is? It's that it's actually been poured into us. The scriptures will say in Romans 5, like, the love of the Father spread abroad in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. So if you're like, I want to experience that love, then you can, with the scriptures, pray, Holy Father, would you spread your love abroad in my heart? I want to experience it. 
This is an invitation to participate with God in his creative work of releasing love through Jesus. And it's our ambition here to see this life released through a community who sees that the way of Jesus is for one another, for the common good. And I don't mean that in an abstract way. I don't mean that in an intellectual sense. I don't mean that in a disembodied theological sense. I mean that literally the life of Jesus, a life lived in full submission to God the Father for the common good released here. So that means like relinquishing our, our preferences even in the space of worship. We were just allowing songs to hopefully serve this community. And the invitation that we want to put forward to, to our congregation is to come and allow those, those songs to lead us to Jesus. There's this one pastor, you might know him, his name's Francis Chan. And somebody came up to him in his congregation. He said, you know, this is after a gathering. He said, I just really, I really wasn't feeling that worship. I heard him out. He said, yeah, it was a little bit, a little bit too loud. I don't know, I don't know the, the, the breadth of the conversation. Maybe the percussion was a bit too punchy. But Francis turns to this guy and he says, that's fine. It wasn't for you anyways. Ooh. Now, we want to have a culture of honor, and we want to be able to receive feedback, and we want to move together, and we want to strive toward excellence. I just think excellence is far too low of a goal for the community of Jesus. We want something higher with more depth and more breadth, because love actually has the willful giving away of our preferences. It doesn't mean we trample over one another and demand somebody to come under. That's not the spirit of Jesus. But the love of Jesus. Do you see this in John 13? I'm off script here for a second, sorry. John 13, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, he stood up, took off his outer garment, and then went to the lowest place to serve and wash his disciples' feet. That is love. That love continues to go as low as you could go, even to the place of death. But the irony is that Jesus' exaltation is up on a cross. When, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. Jesus lifted up on a cross is the healing for the nations. When we look on him, we are healed. This is our Jesus. This is the image of love. This is the one to whom we come. If you came here this morning hopeful for like goosebumps or good Bible teaching, I'm sorry, you're probably not going to get both. But you can get Jesus because it is the foolishness that Jesus offers to shame the wise. So I'm just trying to get all foolish up in here to present the beauty and wisdom of Jesus. It is the foolishness of the cross. It makes no sense, but this is the way of love. And we want to set our heart's ambition toward that, but, we, but I don't know how to attain that, so I need to practice it in community by the power of the Spirit. Is this making sense? Am I alone in the room? Okay. My eyes are telling me one thing, but you can talk back. It's all right. So to get there, how do we do this? Well, we have a little shorthand. You'll see it on my left and on my right. Be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and join Jesus's renewal. You'll notice that Jesus is the beginning. He is the middle, and he is the end. So on the docket for today, practicing being. Now, again, this might sound a little squishy. What, how do I practice being? What does that mean? Well, if you have your thumb in John 15, hold tight. We're going to get over there. But I just invite you, if you would, flip over to Mark chapter 1. This, again, is another gospel text. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. If you want to go over to Mark chapter 1, we're going to um, just kind of track what does it mean to be with Jesus. Mark is going to be a little bit more straightforward in, turn of your, in terms of your uh, evangelists. Mark chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. This is what we read, Mark chapter 1, verse 16. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen, making sense so far. And then Jesus drops this line in verse 17. Come, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Come, follow me. If you're new to Jesus and his way, or if you've, um, perhaps you've been around the church for a long time, but you've not, not yet really considered the lifestyle of love in the face of Jesus, let, let me just invite you to join the Jesus revolution today. Just get a little revolutionary up in you. 
Um, this is wild what Jesus just did. Like we, we read this and it's like, oh, Jesus is having a nice stroll along the lakeside. I have a visual image for that. I've done that before. You just see some people out there throwing a net. Oh, that's cute. Okay. Come, follow me. Oh, Jesus just wants them to enjoy a relaxing day along the Sea of Galilee. No, 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 no. Folks, this is capital W-I-L-D, wild. Jesus is a rabbi. He's a teacher. And he was an itinerant teacher. And as such, rabbis were esteemed in Jesus's time and day, often because of the rigor it took to become a rabbi. You didn't just go online and get ordained as a rabbi. You couldn't just roll up and be like, yep, I'm a rabbi. No, you had to have credentials. You had to have history. You had to have a history with the living God and know his word. And there was a pathway to become a rabbi. That's what makes this interaction so wild. So let me just unpack why this is so wild. Because when you were a young boy or girl, you know, five-ish, you would start in on this school. You would go and you'd begin to memorize the Torah. You would actually, by the time you were 12 or 13, you will have had committed the entirety of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, to memory. Remember, this is an oral culture, so they're telling these stories. This is their YouTube. This is their TikTok. In other words, they're being captured. It's like Grandpa Moshe is just sitting there, and you're sitting at the feet of Grandpa Moshe, and he's telling you about the time when God delivered the people by this strong right arm, and how then they would go up and they'd set this memorial stone, or what we know as an Ebenezer, and you'd go and you'd be walking along the way, and you'd keep the words of God. This is just what happened. You would be telling and retelling the stories to keep the faithfulness of your God before you and on your heart. This is the way that they lived. And then around age 12, you, if you were really, really smart, that is, you had like a, it seemed that you just had a way with the scriptures, you would be invited to keep going. Otherwise, you would be released to uh, ply the family trade. In the case of the people we encountered in our text, Simon and Andrew, it was fishing. But otherwise, you would go to what was called Beit Midrash, the school or the house of learning. And this would often be a separate little structure on the side of your synagogue. And as you would go into Beit Midrash, what you would do is you would move from the Torah, the first five books, and then you would go through the rest of the Hebrew Bible. Just picture that. In the next four years of your life, 13 to 17, 18 ish, you would begin to just draw and drink deeply on the Psalms and the writings and the prophets, and you would get that into the marrow of your bone. You would know that the psalmist will say, I've hidden your word in my heart so I might not sin against you. And you would also then begin to learn the instruction of, of the other rabbis, like Rabbi Shammai or Hillel, and you would begin to learn what the interpretations were and the, other, the way people riffed with the scriptures. You'd begin to say, oh, well, what about this? Well, Moses said this. It's like your life was being immersed in the story of God. It was becoming who you were. You were learning, what does it mean to carry God's heart in my own heart? And then when you were in 17, if you were really, really, really smart, you would have an avenue open to you. And if you weren't, you would go and ply the family trade or go and make, I don't know, cast a net into the sea. And if you were the former, the really, 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 really smart, you would go and you would seek out a rabbi whose way or teaching or yoke you wanted to live under. You you wanted to become like your rabbi. And so you would seek out this rabbi. And and this is then the next stage of learning. It's discipleship. This is to become a mathetes, or the Hebrew word is talmudim. You would come and you would enter into the school of discipleship of your rabbi. So you'd go from Beit Midrash, and then you would go, and you would, with all of your credentials and all of your learnings and all of your interpretation, you would come and present it, and you would apply to be a disciple to a rabbi. Do you now see why it is so wild for Jesus to walk along the seashore with people who are already plying the trade and say, come and follow me? Folks, disciples were not invited by rabbis. They would plead and beg to become disciples, but Jesus flips the script. This itinerant preacher 
Some think that his cousin of just a few years, or, or just a little bit older, John the Baptist, was his rabbi. I think that's an interesting interpretation. I don't know. But it's just like Jesus now with the authority. I mean, we only see this one picture in Luke where he's in his father's house being about his father's business, and they stood astonished at his knowledge of the scriptures. So clearly he's like sought God in the secret place. He knows the heart of, of Yahweh, and he's coming. And now he is calling people to be with him who've been disregarded as those who could become disciples and become rabbis. Because you want to know the path of a disciple? To be, to become, and to join. This is the movement of any disciple. That you would be with your rabbi. You would take up their mannerisms. You would learn their, their patterns of speech. You would learn the idioms that they enjoyed, their interpretations. And eventually you would become, and you would start to practice the things that they did. There is a little, little statement covered in the dust of your rabbi that you would walk so close that the, the sand flipped up off their sandals, it would cover your face. And it would be a, a, like a, a um, I don't know, like it would be an honor for you to be known as a rabbi, to be known as one who follows a rabbi the place of high honor. And here in Mark 1, Jesus goes to those who have already been set aside. This may not feel revolutionary because we're quite familiar with this language, but can I just remind us, like our feelings were never meant to be the pilot of our lives. Simply instruments on the dash to be read for sure, but never the pilot of our lives. If you've ever felt like an outsider, if you've ever felt like a misfit, if you've ever felt like, I don't know if I fit in the church, or I like Jesus, but I'm not so sure about his church, if you've ever felt like that, or what the Bible will call the scum of the earth, let me just say, you have a welcome entry into God's kingdom, according to Jesus. This is who he's looking for. I I love that Jesus is looking for the scum, because it confronts everything I try and do with my life. Jesus invites us to come low. And like he did, take off his outer garment and go to the lowest position because that is the way of love. This is our rabbi, folks. And again, if this doesn't feel revolutionary, trust me, we are not diverting from this. We're just going to set it in front of your hearts until it stirs something up in you like hunger for the way of Jesus. But this is the invitation of Jesus to his school of discipleship, and I think it still stands to us today. No longer is is discipleship defined by striving or earning or presenting oneself as worthy. How many of you, whether you've said or not, you don't have to raise your hands, but how many of you have tried to build a life that you could present to God? Or you've heard others perhaps saying, well, I think my life measures up. I've, I've devoted myself in these ways, and I, I hope it's presentable to God. That is no longer the paradigm with Jesus of Nazareth. He gives us a new and living way. Discipleship is defined first and foremost by calling. He called those. Now, if you're still in Mark 1, flip over with me to Mark chapter 3. And scan down until you get to verse 13, because this is straight fire. Mark chapter 13, we're going to see Jesus going up on a mountainside. Read this with me. Or I'll read it. You can listen. Jesus went up on a mountainside. Mark 3, 13. Jesus went up on a mountainside. Do you know anybody else that has gone up on a mountainside? You're thinking like, oh, this is Moses type stuff. Jesus goes up on a mountainside, but then he does something wild and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. I just want to pause right there. If Jesus is calling to you today, there might be something like his desire for you, but then there is a response that is also required from you. Jesus might just be here today desiring you and inviting you to come to him. Let us not be like those who harden their hearts on the day of visitation, but those with soft hearts and ears that are open and eyes that can see. Then Jesus did this in verse 14. He appointed 12 that they might be with him. And he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. And then he tells us who they are. Folks, I... I'm like, I've been straining throughout the week to just to consider how the heck do I relay how beautiful and marvelous this reality is. Jesus calls us. 
The living God who put on flesh calls us. There's going to be some folks leading up to November of this year who are going to call you. And what you need to do is say, no, I've already been called. There's going to be some telemarketers coming in, calling you out. No, 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 I've already been called. That's just me low-key trying to stir up some stuff that Jesus is the only one worth our allegiance. Just saying. Shall I keep going or should we press on on that? Lord Jesus, have mercy. I hope you see how marvelous this is. You know, we talk about getting called into stuff all the time. We talk about getting called into different spaces, different vocations, different seasons. But do you notice how the emphasis is often on the ta- it, it, the emphasis is often on the task of the calling? So we say things like, I don't know, uh, I feel called to teach. I hear that in seminary contexts a lot. Or I feel called to counsel. I feel called to start a business. Or I feel called to leave this job or move to a new city. Is this making sense? We talk about where we feel called, and then we put the emphasis on the thing that's calling us. And isn't that curious? We put the emphasis on the thing that is calling us, and yet we neglect or downright forget the call of Jesus in the midst of that. I find that really curious that in the midst of our calling, there is one who actually calls us, that our call does not come from the work, but from the very living word. The word has called us. Jesus, whose name is the word, calls us. He is the eternal logos, and he has called us. Can can you just say, he called me? With a little more pizzazz, he called me. Yeah, he did. And he still is. Now, you said it, I didn't. You're like, but you said, say it. He calls us. And please hear me, your work matters. Like what I get to do is so limited. I get to talk to some folks. I get to pray with some folks. And I love this. I'm so grateful. But the reality is, like me being in a coffee shop and having awkward and strained conversations and asking people if I can pray for them, that's like the close. You are every day in a cubicle. You're working on stuff. You're fabricating metals. You're like overseeing plants. You're like operating on people. You're instructing people. You're educating children. Every day you have proximity to be the called ones of God. May this church become a place where it's like we are grateful that people are like in that that Jesus burdens them to release his message, but we may may we not relinquish our work. Because remember, to practice the way is to enter into God's creative work in the world. It's not about the church, it's actually about like the love of God moving through the church to the world. That they might be with him and that he might send them out. Mark literally says that the call of a disciple is to be with Jesus. It is a radical shift in his culture. There is no more striving. And then, I, and then please see this, because again, this is just doubling down on the, on the reality that your work matters. Jesus sends them out to preach, to proclaim, and then to have authority to drive out demons. Anybody? Just driving out demons this week? By the way, I'll just say this. If, if you feel like you're like, I have no idea where to even start right there, can I just give us a little instruction in that regard? Can we go there? Okay. So we stand under the authority of Jesus. We don't have the authority. Oh. So you don't have to like cast down like a spirit of depression. You don't have to cast down an age of anxiety. But what you can do is you can stand in the authority of Jesus and you can say in the power and the authority of Jesus Messiah who has risen from the grave, I command any evil spirit in this place to flee, to leave this place and never come back. And I command you to go to Jesus and be dealt with. And Holy Spirit, I invite you to come and fill this place. It's a very simple reality. If that sounds weird and Pentecostal, just bear with me. This is like super biblical. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. So we just come under his authority. We are saying our weakness is a portal for your strength and that you want to bring your kingdom here on the lakeshore as it is in heaven. To assume that there is a king with a kingdom, and when I read through the scriptures and there's other principalities like the rulers of the air, that means there's opposing kingdoms. So I'm just saying, Jesus, your kingdom is established here. This is your place. So you have authority here. And when we get out of alignment, we we confess, we repent, we come back and we say, Jesus, you have authority here. And it's not 
our authority, it's his authority. That they might be with him. And where does that extend from? It, it extends from the withness. Now, I know that's a weird word, but just say that withness. Withness. It's the withness before the witness. Ooh. Jesus' ministry is defined by proclaiming the gospel and demonstrating the gospel. And he releases his disciples to proclaim the gospel and to demonstrate the gospel. Jesus goes around healing people and casting out demons. So wild. Have you read the gospels recently and just been like, he is just casting out demons all over the place. This is not a, like a sermon on like uh, deliverance or anything like that. But have you noticed when Jesus shows up to the synagogues, People start manifesting in wild ways. And Jesus doesn't be like, okay, let's call the fast. Let's get the prayer team together. He's just like from his reservoir of love in the hidden place, the witness with the Father, he says, out. So I'm just saying, what's normal in the kingdom of heaven is encounters like this and the authority of Jesus is where we get to move into. Folks, we're going to be teaching about this in the coming season. So do you just get... Just, I like to say this, uh, Elijah, this is for you. Gird your loins, folks. Gird it up. But where does it come from? That they might be with him. It all extends from being with Jesus. So we need to practice this. I need to practice it. I am so distractible. I am like a squirrel. My wife can attest to it. I will be invited to participate in a task in our home. And on the way to completing my task, I see something else. And I go, oh, that looks nice. So I just have to rehabituate. I have to train myself to become the type of person who pays attention to this. You know what's so curious to me about practicing being with Jesus? This is our position. This is actually like the called out ones. It, It starts there. This is an identity statement. You know, when you read through the New Testament, you'll, actually, you'll find this group of the called out ones. Do you know what the, in the New Testament, there's a Greek word for it. It's this word, ekklesia. I'm sure you've seen a church here or there called the ekklesia, like ekklesia, and you're like, oh, that's interesting. It just means the assembly or the called out ones, quite literally. We are those people. We are the called out ones. To be called out by Jesus is therefore to be called into his community. So we're not only called out. This thing is not a private thing. It is a corporate thing. We are called into community, the church. And we who have responded with trust and allegiance, this is now our identity. It is both personal. Jesus has called us individually, and it is corporate. He's called us collectively. And so we need one another once again. I just want to see if I can illustrate how this identity piece is crucial to us being with Jesus and how it is who we are. I've used this illustration before, so I apologize if it feels redundant and it's not as you know, wide embracing as it can be, so just forgive. Uh, but right now, I stand before you as Jessica's husband and in a dishonor, I tell you what. But there was a time about a decade or so ago when that was not my reality. And can we just note that like dating in no way prepares you for marriage? I had mentors. I read the books. I did the premarital counseling. I did almost all the stuff. I'm sure there was more that could have been done, but still I had no idea what it meant in practice to be husband, to take on that title. But then the day came. It was July 18th, right? Or is it the 17th? Uh -uh. (laughs) Inside joke right there. But the day came July 18th, 2014, and Brian Williamson, my pastor at the time, he asked me the question. He said, Kyle, do you take this woman and some other stuff? And I said, oh, yeah. And it happened. In that moment, I was husband. I went from single dude to husband, wild. Now, did I know what it meant to be husband? Did I know what it meant to be a Christian husband whose primary role is to come under and give my life away in love as Jesus does for the church to this very moment? No. I had no idea. And did I mess up? Absolutely. Do I still mess up? You know it. Like, I still do this. I hide daggers in my words with Jessica. I hold judgment with a glance. 
I misdirect my frustration with circumstances toward her. It's like that little thing, that expression, kick the dog, you know, it's that kind of thing. It just, it comes out and it goes sideways. This, this stuff still happens. But, but let, let me just put it this way. Like I am, I am regularly coming to Jessica, what feels like almost daily, asking for forgiveness, seeking reconciliation. But in any and all of this, do I ever become semi-husband? Might feel that way, but no. I do not. I am always that. I am husband. It does, my circumstances do, do not shift my position. And folks, the illustration builds, so just bear with. It gets so good right now. Okay, I am both husband and spouse. It is personal and it is communal. This is divine math. And some of you who are like teach math in the room, you're going to love this. One plus one equals one. Now, I thought that was going to land a lot better in the room, so... Um. <laughs> See, Jessica cannot be husband. That's not her role. She is wife and spouse, and therefore we are one. One plus one equals one. And so, too, in the ecclesia, we, who are many, have become one. We are baptized into one spirit. This is the reality of the church. We, who are many, have become one in Christ. The dividing wall of hostility has been torn down. We are one though we are many. Robert Mulholland, in his primer on spiritual formation, says it this way. He says, Scripture reveals that human wholeness is always actualized in nurturing one another toward wholeness. goes on to explain what he means there. He says, Spiritual formation for the sake of others will be seen to move against the grain of a privatized and individualized religion. And the deep-seated belief that spiritual life is a matter between the individual and God. Folks, our formation in the way of Jesus, our discipleship to Jesus, withness before the witness, is always for the good of others. And it will be an affront personally, and it might confront others. And yet, this is who we are, and we are learning to be who we already are. This is such a gift because you don't have to have all your poop in a pile. You don't have to have all your stuff together. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to be actually practicing. The invitation is to practice, not perfect the way of Jesus. And does that give a license for sin and disobedience? No. It actually is a deeper invitation to say that there's nothing, nothing that will disqualify me. Peter, may we be reminded of Peter, who denies Jesus, goes back to plying his trade, and Jesus, in that space, seeks him out and again says, follow me. So in your failure, there is mercy. Let me just tell you, his mercy is greater than your sin. And you're like, but what if I've committed the unforgivable sin, the unpardonable sin? If your conscience is burdened by that, you have not done that. The Pharisees who saw the divine, who saw Yahweh manifest in Jesus, they deny that it was God and put him up on a cross. That's the unforgivable, the unpardonable. So there's that theological quandary just squashed in a moment. If your conscience is burdened by Jesus because you want to be with him, his mercy is greater than your sin. Is your sin uncleansed by the blood? See, pride has two sides, does it not? Pride can exalt, but pride can also go low. This is a weird thing, but we can go low and think that we are outside of the domain of God's grace. But God's grace is such that it meets us in the depths and pulls us out. Where can I go from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I go down to the depths of Sheol, there you are. That is the depth of his love. This is who we are called to be. To be with Jesus. To become like him and to join him. And to be with Jesus is the priority of our discipleship to be to Jesus because everything flows from this. And to show you how I come here and how, not just me, but people for the ages, if your thumb is still there, go with me back to John 15. Verse 5. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain, if you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. To the way of Jesus, it is an invitation to discover Jesus and with him find life. There is life to be had with Jesus. John Mark Comer, who writes about this passage and talks regularly about this, this is like 
he gets this in, in part from Dallas Willard, and we're getting it from him, so this isn't novel. It's just carrying it forward for our community. But he says, like, talks about how the word abide here, this Greek word minnow or remain, it is the, like the hinge upon which this passage swings. Some ten times Jesus talks about remaining, remaining, remaining. What other translators say, to make your home in. Abide or remain or make your home in. Jesus is say, saying, we need to be rehomed. And this might sound odd, but unless you are out there doing like viticulture and you're making wine, I don't know if the, the whole vine and branch thing makes sense to you. So let me just share how this landed for me. We are like stray dogs or we are like dogs who've been in a home who don't quite get along. Our temperament doesn't quite match the vibe of the home. And we need to be rehomed. We need to get a new master with a new place where we can truly live because this old place does not present an opportunity for us to live. And you're like, I do not want to think about myself as a dog. Then be a branch. But for me, I, I went with the dog thing. I want to be rehomed in Jesus. And that is what Jesus' call does to me. It invites me to be rehomed. And the question, folks, it is not, do we abide? The question is not, do we make our home somewhere? The question is, in stress and in boredom and in pain, where do you remain? Where do you go? When it hurts, where does, where does your mind feel constantly drawn to? Where do you direct your attention? When you're standing in line at the grocery and there's three people in front of you, what do you reach for? The call of Jesus is a call to be rehomed in the love of God. And Jesus makes clear that there is life and abundance and joy even amid suffering, what Jesus calls much fruit. And yet, this is conditional because it's an invitation. If you remain, if you remain. See, for many of us, we have spent years, decades even, trying to suck the life out of insufficient sources to make sense of our life. We've been bearing the fruit of frustration and malice and bitterness. And now Jesus stands before us this morning calling us to new life with him. And I would just dare say, like, we should expect some interior resistance to this. Like, the old patterns and habits would surface, old dwellings, if you would, to call out to us in our discomfort. And as we begin to close, I just want us, I want us, to, want us to be pastured by Dallas Willard. So let his words kind of guide you in this here for a moment. The first and most basic thing we can and must do is keep God before our minds. Because you're asking the question, how do I be? This is how you be. The first and most basic thing we can and must do is keep God before our minds. This is the fundamental secret of caring for our souls. Our part in thus practicing the presence of God is to direct and then redirect our minds constantly to him. In the early time of our practicing, which is where we are, we may well be challenged by our burdensome habits of dwelling on things less than God. That is, this is, we will be, that is, will be, I don't know. This will be constantly distracted by a million other things. But folks, these are just habits, not the law of gravity, and these habits can be broken. A new grace-filled habit will replace the former ones as we take intentional steps toward keeping God before us. Notice he does not say, as we accidentally stumble into Jesus' presence. No, a new grace-filled habit will replace it. In a moment, I'm just going to ask us to audit our time, to give permission to the Father to prune for Jesus to give us a place in his presence and for the Holy Spirit to come and keep us. But I would just, I would say this now, like what is drawing your mind? Because it, it will, it must be a new grace-filled habit, not a, not a selfish habit, not a habit, not a, not a willpower thing. A new grace-filled habit will replace the former ones as we take intentional steps toward keeping God before us. Soon our minds will return to God as the needle of a compass constantly returns to the north. If God is the great longing of our souls, he will become the pole star of our inward beings. He will be the one that orients our whole life. This all just starts with being with him. 
I can think of nothing more beautiful than the reality that the living God has a desire to be with us. So fierce is his love that he gave his life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. I mean, folks, this is like, this is the essence, the core of the gospel of Jesus, that there is a king who has come low to serve, and we are invited to be with him. Kings and priests in the new heavens and new earth, come on. And he wants us to be with him. He's inviting us in. If you have a voice of like shame or condemnation coming up, and you're thinking, I actually don't think I'm worthy to go there, says who? Jesus has made space for you through his blood. In a moment, we're going, to take, we're going to take the bread and the cup. He says, if you eat my flesh, if you drink my blood, I will remain in you and you and me. Jesus is calling us to make our home in him. Christ, Christ, think about this. In Christ, you can release your spouse from having to be the source of your identity. And you can love them freely. They don't have to be your end all be all. In Christ, you can see your friends as gifts, people to be cherished rather than transactional relationships waiting to be cashed in according to your needs. In Christ, your job can be transformed into a place of praise where memos and lattes and briefs and emails and hammers can be instruments of worship rather than drudgery and delays for the weekend. In Christ, your children can be free from healing your unprocessed wounds and in turn be treasured as the gifts they are. Church, Jesus is calling us to make our home in him so that we might bear much fruit. If you remain in me. If you remain in me. You will not this day perfect being with Jesus and thank God that no one's asking you to. But there's an invitation before you to begin to move toward God who's already moved toward you in Christ. It's just an open, it's like Madison, our youth pastor, will talk about this. She's just like turning aside. Like there's this theological principle called omnipresence that God is everywhere you are and where, like he's whenever, wherever. That, that is God. He is ever present. And yet I think we're interested in something a little bit more than, than a theological principle of omnipresence. I am interested in the manifest presence of Jesus. Like, I, I am interested in the God who would draw so near that he would make us shudder because glory has come into the room. The, the God with whom there is healing in his wings. The God who would then invite his followers to be sent out to heal and to drive out spirits who would have no place in his good world. If you're in the room and you're like, I would love for the living God to remind me that he wants me. I would love, like I feel like a, a lethargy. I feel like a slothfulness in my spirit. I, want, I need the living God to remind me that he wants me. Would you be so bold as to raise your hand? Just keep it up for a moment. Keep it up. I, I just want to, I want to pray for you. Holy Father, there is hunger in this room. And like the law of gravity, you are drawn toward the hungry. God, for those who feel like a type of slothfulness in their spirit, for those who are sitting here going, I want more of you, but I don't know what it means to take a step towards you in this next season. Spirit of the living God, I pray that you would begin to move in this place. Spirit of Jesus, spirit of truth. We just say you are welcome here. God, I ask that you would bring refreshment. I thank you for the audacity of faith of these people who would simply raise a hand and say, you know what? Don't tell me that there is not a God who can meet me in my need. Don't tell me that there isn't a God who cannot move toward my discomfort. There is life. There is much fruit on offer. And so, Jesus, with this, I simply say, here I am. So, Jesus, you said, we did not say it. You said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So to the spirit of forsakenness, Jesus, would you release your promise of presence? 
Just pray, Jesus, across this room, you would begin to release the presence of Jesus. Your spirit would begin to move. And as we take in your bread and cup, as we take in your life, would we remember that you are the living God? In John 14, the scripture says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. How will we remain? Folks, let me tell you, it is not of your own strength, but it is by the gift of the spirit of truth. So spirit of truth, we ask that you would draw us to remain with Jesus. With Jesus, we are not alone. We get to practice his way in the presence of Jesus. So collectively, I, I would just invite us here in this next moment as a, as a community. You can put your hands down if you want, but um, there's just these three simple lines that I would invite us to pray together as a community. And the lines are as follows. Father, you have permission to prune my life. Jesus, I receive your place for me. And Holy Spirit, come and keep me. And so if you would, let's just read these slowly, collectively. Um, your voice, as you say this, is a gift for the person next to you. So if you would, please just join me in reading this first line and we'll pause and then I'll lead us into the next one. Starting with Father. Father, you have permission to prune my life. Let's read that again so we can all hear one another. Father, you have permission to prune my life. The pruning is not punishment. The pruning is a gift so more fruit would come and yet it still will hurt. There will be a cutting either way. There will either be a cutting because there is no fruit or there will be a pruning to produce much fruit. Receive his pruning in the name of Jesus. Let us come to Jesus, the one who lives to make intercession for us. Read this with me, church. Jesus, I receive your place for me. Now let us declare this, church. Jesus, I receive your place for me. Jesus, you have called us out of darkness into light. You have called us and given us a new name. And we simply say we turn aside to receive your place. And may we, may we pray, Holy Spirit, come and keep me. Let's pray that again. Holy Spirit, come and keep me. So I invite those who are serving the bread and the cup to come forward. As the elements pass, um, We'll just have a time for you to attend, to be attended to by Jesus. And I'll come up when they've all passed and I'll pray and we'll continue to respond and worship through song. Hear the words of Jesus in John chapter 6. 
Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. So church, would you stand as you are able, and would you come to the one who has the words of spirit and life? I just want to pray. Um, God has given us the gift of his Holy Spirit as he's drawn us from death to life, and yet some of us, I feel like God wants to like release his presence and release his kindness and release his love in a fresh way. Um, so if you, if you were one of those people who raised your hand or you're, or you're in the room this morning and you, have, you feel like you have a hunger building up inside of you, if you feel like your heart is beating pretty fast right now, I, I would say this is for you to just extend your hands in front of you. The living God has just spoken to us through his word and is worthy of a response. He is worthy of us saying yes and amen. And so I would just say, if you felt an offense, there is space here because Jesus has the words of eternal life. And so I just want to ask if um, and pray over the room that the spirit of Jesus, where there is an openness to receive his ministry and presence and the mediating love of the Father, if you're open, if you want to receive that, the Spirit of Jesus is willing to move towards you. So if that's you, I just invite you to open your hands. You can open them as wide as you want. It could be a little cup in front of you. He wants to give without measure, press down, spilling over. So Spirit of the living God, we just, we come to you who are able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. And we ask that you would in this moment begin to pour out the love of the Father into the hearts of those who are saying, I am hungry. On the cross, Jesus, you said, I thirst. And we just echo the cries of the Son. We thirst. We long like in a dry and weary land, like dry and parched grain. We, we want living waters to come and quench our deepest of thirsts. We need you, Jesus, who broke the rock. You need to gush into this room and fill us. You said that there would be waters that come forth from beneath the throne of the temple, extending out to the ends of the earth, bringing refreshment. You say that on the both sides, on east and west, as far around, that the tree of life with healing in its leaves is available. So Jesus, according to your kindness, would you release your presence? Would you begin to fill us with hope and longing and life? Jesus, the time is here to build hunger, so we need you to want you. You say that we love because we were first love. So I pray for those who have darkened the doors of first love, that you would give them the ears to hear, that you stand at the door of their heart, you knock. You say, come, let me dine with you. If they took in the bread, if they took in the blood, would they know that there is life and life everlasting to be had? Witness to them from their inner woman and inner man. We pray, Jesus, that you would fill us to give us the gift of life. Would you build hunger in the room? So Jesus, here we are. Here is your bride. You said you would build your church. And for those of us who are standing here today who are saying we are open, 
Would you come? Would you come, Holy Spirit? Would you grace us with your presence? We don't want a moment. We don't just want a nice little moment where the goosebumps come. We want the manifest presence of the living God so that we might be with you and become compelled to be your disciples here to the ends of the earth. Jesus, we want to see your glory. I think you want to show us your glory. The Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. You're welcome to fill this room. You're welcome to do what you want. You're welcome to speak in a whisper and call us out, to call us up, to call us in. Jesus, you are welcome through your words to draw us. You are welcome to bend us to the floor. You are welcome to do whatever you need to do in this room. May we be willing to receive it. So I pray that, Jesus, you would release courage in the room to receive what you want to do through your church. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, would you come in power, we pray. Amen.
and I will make room for you to do whatever you want to do whatever you want to
to worship you. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. All the angels cry out, holy is the Lord. And all the earth replies, holy are you. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. May we grow ever and becoming more like Jesus every single day. We love you, we're thankful for you, and we'll see you next week.